Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, I know that's a little loud. Welcome to Geneva Community High School. My name is Tom Rogers. And I'm not sure I've ever been prouder to be the principal of Geneva High School. Thank you all for being here. I think it speaks volumes that we have a very full auditorium right now. Um, I'm not going to lie, I'm getting a little emotional looking out at all of you because back in early December when we started to plan for this, there were people who attended our first couple of meetings who said, you'll be lucky to get 15 or 20 people to show up. So give yourselves a huge round of applause for being here. to start tonight by answering a question that I've been asked several times, but I'm thinking you probably all know the answer because you're here. But the question I've been asked several times is, why are you doing this? First and foremost, it's because I, as the principal, and the outstanding team of administrators that I work with, and the educators who work here on a daily basis, care about our students. And to demonstrate how much they care, I, want, I would ask all of the District 304 employees who are in the audience this evening, would you just please stand up for a moment? Thank you to all those people for being here. And I'll, I will thank some specific people uh, later on this evening because there are a lot of people who are instrumental in making this such a huge success tonight. But another reason we're doing this is because, unfortunately, we had a rough first semester here at Geneva High School. I think many of you know that despite the fact that we plead and beg with our students to make great choices, to lead healthy lives, unfortunately, we saw firsthand back in September what unhealthy choices and poor decisions can do. There were multiple families that were devastated by the things that occurred this past fall. There were large groups of friends put in turmoil because of what happened in the fall. Our school went through a very difficult period of time and it impacted our community in a very negative way. So much so that I think we need to start talking about this topic. In the past approximately five years, I'm aware of nine Geneva High School graduates. And those are just the ones I'm aware of. I hope there aren't more. But I know there have been nine Geneva High School graduates that have passed away. Some of them as a result of drug and alcohol activity. Maybe not using it directly, but things that went on. Drugs and alcohol were a, were a factor. So again, those types of statistics tell me we need to be talking about this. So we've invited a keynote speaker in this evening who I'll introduce in just a moment. And he's going to talk to us. And he is an expert at getting all of us to start talking. He has dealt firsthand with the types of devastation I just described that we dealt with back in September. When our keynote speaker is done talking this evening, we've given all of you a note card. We hope that you will write down some questions that you have. If you don't want to ask them in person, you will be able to ask questions in person, and this microphone will be passed around the audience uh, at the end of the evening. But, if we, but we will collect those note cards as soon as our speaker has completed his portion of the night. We will then, after we collect those cards, invite a panel of experts up onto the stage where they will talk about the things that they've experienced, the things they're seeing and hearing out in our community. After they've explained a little bit about what they do and what they can do to help with this situation, we will then begin the question and answer session and we'll rotate back and forth between people who want to ask a question from the audience using this microphone and the cards that have been submitted. After the panel is done sharing information, we'll collect another batch of cards. So we will walk you through the process that we're going to use uh, as we move along. And then finally, one of the most important pieces of this evening is that we have resources available out in our cafeteria. It was one of the first recommendations that our speaker, Tim Ryan, made to us when we started meeting about this. 
He talked about the fact that it's easy for him to come talk, share his experiences, and then say goodbye to all of us and walk out the door. And then we're left wondering, okay, what do we do next? He said the key is you've got to have people there when I'm done talking who, if we can get people to raise their hand, and you're going to hear him talk about this tonight, if people will raise their hands and ask for help, we need to point them in the right direction and find out and, and let people know who can they go to for help. We have more than a dozen organizations out in the cafeteria who are willing to help. Who you can talk to on an individual basis this evening, pick up a card, uh, get a link to a website, connect with someone. So we're going to have that opportunity after our speaker, after our panel, and after our question and answer session. So we've got a full agenda and we want to keep moving. So at this time we're going to introduce to you a gentleman who did an outstanding job speaking to all of our high school students yesterday and who's going to help us all start the conversation about drugs and alcohol. Please welcome Mr. Tim Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, how are we doing? This is amazing. I commend the school, everyone that put this together. Um, Sheriff Kramer and I did an event a couple of years ago. I think 12 people showed up. Um, we've got a pandemic going on. Do not be the parent that sits here and says, not my family, we live in Geneva, Illinois. We're a good family, we go to church on Sunday, so what? Some of the things I say might shock you, but it's a reality. Um, I'm gonna give you just a little bit of my story on how, where I got to, but then I wanna talk about solutions. I wanna talk about what's happening with the kids here, um, and we'll take it from there. My name is Tim Ryan, I'm a grade four recovering alcoholic and drug addict. Um, I also go by R68915, that's my Illinois Department of Corrections number, that's where I got clean and sober by being sentenced to seven years in prison. When I grew up in Crystal Lake, Illinois, um, I always wanted to be a professional water skier and stuntman. I never wanted to be a drug addict and alcoholic. I came from a wonderful family. My dad worked at the Chicago Board of Trade for 26 years for a company by the name of E.F. Hutton. Um, when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. Yeah. He started as whatever, became senior vice president, ran the entire country. Never missed a day of work in 26 years. My mom was the second employee in a little company by the name of Market Day, which we started in a garage in Hinsdale in 1974. We were latchkey kids. They were always working. We had dinner every night at 6.30. We were all adopted. My older brother, I was just a jerk. There was me. My little brother and sister, Katie and Kevin, they're three-quarter Chippewa Indians. So I grew up with a lot of racism, with my little brother and sister being dark-skinned in Chris Lake, Illinois in the 70s. Um, I was a kid that struggled with learning disabilities, ADD, dyslexia. I was a stupid kid. You know, I was in Chicago last year and I saw a doctor by the name of Gabor Mate speak at a huge conference, and I was one of three people that was not a clinician at this conference. He's been working with people that struggle with substance abuse for 40 years. When he meets with someone struggling, he doesn't say, why the addiction? He says, why the pain? What's the underlining factors? Everybody that struggles with substance abuse has some underlining form of trauma whether it's mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, sexual. When I looked at my life, I said, I don't have any trauma. And then Dr. Mate said, how many people here are adopted? When I put my hand up, he said, do you realize you're 48,000 times more susceptible to be an alcoholic or drug addict due to the abandonment issues, even though I knew it? ADD, learning disabilities, yeah, that's a form of trauma. My older brother beat me up for eight years straight, every day, trauma and I was molested by a female babysitter at 12 years old. Trauma, and I compartmentalized it all. And I was a kid as a freshman in high school that wore the masks. How you doing, I'm great, I'm great. I used humor to fit in. I used my smart mouth to fit in. I hung out with all the older kids. The only thing I excelled at was water skiing. I grew up on the lake, that was my playground. From 14 to 21, I was one of the top ranked barefoot water skiers in the country. But at 49 years old, I can't tell you how to use the word there in the sentence. T-H-E-R-E-I-E-R -E -E the other way, throw it out the window. Can't comprehend it. Birds, pronouns, adjectives. Can't wrap my head around them. So where'd I fit in? Drinking. 14 years old, going up to Lake Geneva. I bet you a few of you snuck up to Lake Geneva 20, 30 years ago, because I know I did. At 15 years old, I was with two of my buddies. 
We're at a gentleman's house. His older brother was there. They were doing cocaine. He said, you guys want to try one line? We tried one line, and that night I was having one of the drugs fronted to me. I thought that's what I was looking for. The rest of high school for me was I got on the work program. I ran a pizza restaurant every Friday, Saturday, Sunday night. It was party, party, party. Um, when I got out of high school at a 1.4 grade average, I took the ACT four or five times, and I get 11 each time. Not the sharpest tool in the shed when it comes to education. <clears throat> I always worked, but I'm the guy that every night was with myself, by myself, crying to myself, saying I can't stop. I went down to college because they had something called open admissions. I went down to college in Monroe, Louisiana, because they had the best intercollegiate water ski team in the country. So I went down to Northeast Louisiana University to get on the water ski team. As soon as my mom hopped in that rental car to get back to the airport, I went to the liquor store, and I was drunk within two hours. I liked Louisiana because the drinking age was 18. It was three to one girl to guys. I could hunt and fish, and I could go get on the water ski team. I got into ecstasy, I got into magic mushrooms, acid, more cocaine. I had a bumper sticker on the back of my 78 Ford Fairmont that said, in search of the eternal pause. See, I was searching through happiness through drugs and alcohol, when in hindsight they caused all my problems. See, the water ski team I went to get on, I never got on, because I started hearing this thing in my life, Tim, you're a liability. You don't go to class, you party too much, you cause chaos, the police are always chasing you around campus. You're not on the team. I went to college with a, a country western singer by the name of Tim McGraw. Some of you might have heard of him. But Tim didn't go by the name Tim McGraw, he went by the name Tim Smith. And I can remember he played at a bar, he knocks a cafe on Wednesday nights. And I had heard a friend of his say, why don't you take your father's last name? His father was Tug McGraw, a professional baseball player. He said, because my dad's an alcoholic, he's a loser. If you follow Tim McGraw, Tim McGraw is also an alcoholic. He's been clean and sober since 2008. So what that shows me is the disease of addiction is hereditary. It gets passed down generation to generation. But there is still a big stigma with addiction. Have the willpower. Stop. Don't hang out with those loser friends. It's a disease. 1956, the American Medical Association declared alcoholism a disease. And you can throw drug addiction in there too. I go out and drink. I don't have an off switch. There's a few of you in here that can go to the bar after work and have two beers and go home. I'm going to have six beers. I'm going to have six shots. I'm going to drink vodka. And eventually I'll break out. I'll break out windows, I'll break out teeth, and son of a bitch, I'll always break out in a pair of handcuffs because I don't know how to stop. That's when the disease kicks in. Kicked out of college, back, odd jobs, more cocaine, freebasing cocaine, dealing cocaine, consequences. At 21 years old, I checked myself into drug treatment. A place called Parkside Lodge of Mundelein, Illinois. When I went into drug treatment at 21 years old, I went in with the thought pattern, I just want to quit doing drugs and I want to figure out how to drink like a normal person because the drugs are the problem, it's not the drinking. I like drug treatment. I can tell you there was 13 Chicago police officers and there was four people that worked for the railroad. That's all I remember. Because I never listened to the similarities, I always listened to all the differences. What I didn't realize until after I got in the treatment space, they had the EAP contract, so that's where all the cops went that had an issue, and that's where all the people that went for the railroad. But I didn't look at it that way. <clears throat> I did my 30 days, and on February 2nd of 1990, a gentleman like me came in and spoke. And he shared his story, and he looked at all 38 of us. And he said, one of you will be sober, and a third of you will be dead in a year. And I put my hand up. I said, excuse me, sir, there's 38 of us here. He said, listen to me, kid. One of you will be sober, and a third of you will be dead. I said, what do I do? He said, don't drink and go to those 12-step meetings. Get a sponsor, work the steps. Everyone know what a 12-step base meeting is? Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics, Heroin Anonymous, Cocaine, blah, blah, blah. But there's also Christian-based programs like Celebrate Recovery. There's Smart Recovery. There's Refuge Recovery, which is Buddhist-based. I'm getting ready to get out of treatment. My father sits me down. And it still irks me to this day. And he said, Tim, where do we go wrong as parents? I said, Dad, you didn't do anything wrong. You and Mom are the greatest parents in the world. And he said, oh, I know that, son. 
I go, okay, where are you going with this one? He said, well, while you were in treatment, your mother and I got a little help. See, that cult called Al-Anon got to my mom and dad. Not many people go because you didn't laugh too much. <laughs> if you don't know what Al-Anon is, then there's Families Anonymous and Naranon. It's for family members that have a loved one struggling with substance abuse or alcoholism. You go work your own program. And my dad said, Tim, I learned something from al I said, what would you learn, Pops? He said, I didn't cause your disease. I can't cure it, and I can't control it. And guess what, buddy? I ain't going to contribute to it either. What's that mean, Dad? He said, well, you're welcome to come home, but the day you start drinking or doing drugs, your ass is out of the house. Deal. <laughs> so I started going to Chris Lake Alamo Club every day. I went to four or five meetings a week. But see, I'm the guy that thought I could get sober through osmosis. If I hang out with sober people, I'll get sober. And I'd put my hand up, I'm looking for a sponsor, nobody would pick on me, I'd be like, yes, got away with it again. Started a business, run a water ski school, I started competing again in barefoot water skiing, I won Illinois State, Michigan State, Wisconsin State, I slotted to win the U.S. Nationals that year. And at the Midwest Regionals, I blew out three discs in my lower back, and Dr. Wu introduced me to 300 Vicodin a month. You're supposed to walk like a monkey, take these, you'll be fine, I can remember it like yesterday. And I really didn't like the Vicodin, and I was at a meeting, and some big guy comes up to me and says, kid, you're the stupidest person I ever met. I heard this a lot in life, too. I said, what are you talking about? He said, kid, if you want a sponsor, you've got to go ask somebody. You can't just put your hand up. No one's going to pick on you. You seek someone out. Really, that's how this program works. So instead of doing that, I quit going to meetings. And I ended up at a Grateful Dead concert. Poster and a fatty, $7. It was really a cool poster, so I bought it, and I smoked that one joint. And within two days, I was right back to drinking and doing cocaine like it had never stopped. And I lost my businesses, and I figured I'll relocate. I'll just move to Texas, get away from all my problems. But there's the saying, wherever you go, there you are. You take yourself with you. And I moved down with my buddy, Trayson. And uh, three weeks later, I wanted to get high, and I flipped on the news, and they shot someone on 13th Street. So I hopped on my motorcycle, and I went to 13th Street. So I know if they're shooting people, they're selling drugs. See, I don't think like normal people. If there, is there anyone normal in here? I didn't think so. Is there any perfect family in here? Didn't think so either. If you put your hand up, we will have a discussion. Because um, there isn't. And even for the parents sitting in here, did anyone give you a book on how to be a good parent, how to raise a proper kid? No. And where do we learn from? From our parents, from our peers, and we might make mistakes because we don't know what the hell we don't know. And again, man, I, I'm blown away that this place is packed like this. I wish every community, like Geneva, Illinois, was focused on their loved ones and their kids as much as you guys are. I commend you for that. So anyhow, I went back to doing drugs and pulled some credit card fraud on my friend, and he found out, had me arrested, and I got to spend a month in the Travis County Jail, and being the only white guy in an all-black pod from Chicago, uh, yeah, didn't go too well. I had the opportunity to get my butt kicked a few times. Got to sleep next to the toilet because I didn't have the right to sleep in a bed. And as soon as I got out, my MO in life was, well, I'll go back to those meetings. And I'll hang out with these sober people. And then we started marketing cable television door to door. I hightailed it out of Texas. I'd have worn out for 20 years. I was actually down in Argyle, Texas last week, speaking it was nice to be in the state legally because they got some damn good barbecue and I like Texas. Um, traveling the country, thinking I'd stay sober through osmosis. A year later, I started my own cable marketing company. I started making a lot of money. I had 60 people working for me, and at 22 years old, I was making about $25,000 a week free and clear. Every time I made money, I thought I could go back to drinking and doing drugs. And my dad always had a philosophy, Tim, you make interest on your money, you don't pay interest. That guy never bought, the only thing he ever financed in his life was his house, and he bitched about a $180 mortgage payment. His house was $38,000. Christ, my truck was just $60,000, I don't even drive. But in recovery, I do have a full-time driver in a company car, it's a pretty good deal. Not a bad deal, I'm at. That's my 19-year-old son. He's on salary. He gets to drive me around and travel the country, which is a miracle of recovery today. I didn't think normally. Money 
was happiness. I never planned for the future. I never planned for the day. And I went right back to drinking and doing drugs. And within a year, year and a half, I buried this company. The 60 families that worked for me were out of work. I came back, 80,000, I owed the IRS, quarter million in debt, go back to meetings. Stumbled into the recruiting space as a headhunter, made a lot of money. Making money was easy for me, but I never knew how to manage it. I've made millions of dollars. To me, it was just, I don't care about it because I never appreciated it until I actually got clean and sober. I never appreciated it. Um, Anyone got a time machine? I can go back in time. <laughs> buy some Oracle stock, buy some Microsoft, buy some Apple. Damn. I'm only joking. I started as a headhunter. About uh, eight months in, I started drinking and doing drugs. But if I made 30 grand a year, Bob made 30 a month, 30,000. We split everything. So Bob let me do what I wanted. I got the opportunity to go work for a management consulting firm in Chicago. I always had work ethic. I lived in Lake in the Hills now. I had a townhouse there. My office was off Cumberland Avenue in the 90. If my boss was in at 6.30 in the morning, I was in at 6. If he left at 7 at night, I left at 7.30. My boss thought I was the next best thing to slice bread. All you do is work. Well, there's a method to what I did because there was a Bennigan's restaurant. So I'd interview you at noon, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, because I could sit at the bar and drink all day have a little cocaine delivered, my life was good. So I thought. And I had a lot of things that made me feel good. I had a brand new custom Harley, I had a brand new custom ski and teak boat, I had a pearl white Jeep. But that same thing, every night I'm with myself, by myself, crying to myself, saying I can't stop. I had all these things that made me feel good, and I was the loneliest, most miserable person in the entire world. And my ego got big because everyone I was hiring had MBAs and PhDs from Cal Poly, Berkeley, Harvard, Yale, MIT, Northwestern, Brown, Rice, University of Chicago. I only hired the best of the best. And I'm the guy at the 1.4 grade average who got the 11 on his ACT, making more money than all these fools. Well, you're not fools if you're in the tech space. Sorry, don't take it that way. Um, <clears throat> my life was miserable. But the hardest thing for me to do, right here, I need some help. I didn't know how to put my hand up and ask for help. And I walked into work one day, this beautiful lady sitting behind the front desk, she had a peach outfit on. And I walked in and I said, hey, Peachy, how are you? She said, I'm good. I said, who are you? I said, I'm Shannon Hoban, the new receptionist. Who are you? I said, I am Tim Ryan, the director of recruiting. She goes, oh, you're the jerk that didn't want to hire me. I said, what are you talking about? She goes, weren't you looking to hire a personal secretary assistant about a month ago? I said, yeah. She goes, weren't you giving my resume? I said, you're the banker lady, aren't you? She said, yep. I said, I don't like bankers. I never called you in for an interview, but I'll make it up to you. I'll take you out for a drink. She said, okay. So two weeks later, Vic, the other recruiter, and I took Shannon down to Bannigan's, and she had two beers. And she got up and went to the bathroom, and I remember Vic going, wow, she's really cute. I'm going to ask her out. No, but I got this one in the bag. So I waited for her to come out of the bathroom, and I kind of starved her, and I gave her a kiss. I said, you're my new girlfriend. She said, I like that, but I got one question to ask you. Do you do drugs? No. Why would you ask me a stupid question like that? <clears throat> she said, I've got a three-year-old son by the name of Nicholas who's got a deadbeat dad who abandoned us. He's a drug addict, and I want nothing to do with the drug addict. Man, I don't do drugs. She said, good, let's go on another date. She went home to Naperville, I went to Chicago and bought a quarter ounce of cocaine. Because everything that came out of my mouth was a lie. We started hanging out every weekend, every night after work. And about five months later, the pill didn't work. And son of a gun, she's pregnant. So I dragged her ass down to the DuPage County Courthouse and I married her. And I adopted Nick. And Maxwell came along. And uh, nine months after Max was born, well, she was pregnant with Tanner. Then Tanner came along, and nine months after Tanner was born, she was pregnant with Daddy. See, the one thing I was good at was making babies. <laughs> that's easy. Take care of them, that's a whole other concept. In all seriousness, we get married, Nick's five, Shannon's pregnant with Tanner, Max is 14 months old, and my wife realizes she is living with a full-blown alcoholic and drug addict. But my wife tried to rescue me. My wife didn't tell anybody. 
she kept it our little family secret. She didn't tell my mom and dad. She didn't tell her parents because Shannon thought she could help me. She thought she could save me. In hindsight, that lady would have left me in a second. It would have been the best thing she ever did. I'd been up doing cocaine for a few days. I passed out. Woke up in the morning. Max was crawling towards my home office. And I picked him up and I put him in his room and I went and opened my office door and what was all over the floor? Cocaine. Lots of it. If my son would have crawled in and put one of those rocks of cocaine in his mouth, it would have killed him instantly. What's my MO? Go back to meetings. This time, the West Suburban Fellowship Club in Naperville opened an Alano Club where they house 12 step based meetings, Al Anon, whatever. And I kind of got a sponsor. I kind of started working the steps, and I made it over a year clean and sober. Start another consulting firm with my old boss, making a bunch of money. Building Shannon and the kids a beautiful five bedroom house out in Oswego, three car garage. My neighbor and I ran 35 Cub Scout dens. As an assistant pack master, we did every parade, Pinewood Derby. Life was good. Then I met Joel. Joel showed up at one of those 12 step base meetings. We started hanging out. We're the same age. We, it was crazy. God's got a weird sense of humor. <clears throat> I asked Joel what he did, and he told me I'm a computer graphics guy, but 10 years ago I used to work for this place in Chicago called On Time Courier. I said, was Mike your manager? He said, yeah, why? I said, on Randolph Street? He said, yeah. I said, did you know a guy by the name of Darris? He was that hillbilly from Louisiana with the red pickup truck? I said, yep, that's Darris. He goes, how do you know Darris? I said, he is my best friend in college, and when I dropped out, he came back with me. So my buddy from college worked with Joel 10 years prior. So we had an instant bond. We started hanging out. And about three weeks later, he said, Tim, would you take me to Chicago to move out of my apartment? I said, sure. And as we're moving Joel out, now remember, I'm over a year clean and sober, but I'm not applying the tools of recovery in my life because I'm the guy that thought if I hang out with people, I'll stay sober. Drugs and alcohol were my solution. They weren't my problem. My thinking was my problem. And as we're moving Joel out, out of the bedroom, his roommate's out of the pops. What are you doing? I'm moving out, Joel. What are you doing? Heroin. You want to do some? Sure. That quick. What's one bag of heroin going to do? What's one bag of heroin going to do? That was it, man. That one bag of heroin turned into a $500 a day habit for 12 years. I've overdosed on heroin eight times. I've been clinically dead free. I've had two heart attacks. Heroin destroyed my world. I want to explain a few things to you here. And I'm ADD, so I go all over and I remember what I was saying and I come back, so blame it on my teachers. <laughs> West Elementary School, North Grades, Junior High, Chris Lake Central. Just if you're asking. Let's talk about weed real quick. Any pot smokers in here growing up? Come on, who pop? A bunch of liars, just like the students. Son of a gun. The weed we hypothetically grew up smoking was 8 to 10 percent THC. The weed today is 40, 50, 60, 70 percent THC. If they're smoking dabs, it could be 80, 90 percent pure. This stuff isn't weed today. This is manufactured to be deadly and very potent. DUI arrests since they legalized in Colorado up 28 percent. That's with kids under 25 years old. I can remember in high school, 1985, 6, driving and being so high I had to pull over the car because I forgot where I was going. I couldn't imagine smoking this weed today. If I were to lock the doors in here right now and all of us in here smoked weed for a week straight and drank alcohol, at the end of the week, from here over, we'll have a substance abuse issue. From here over, won't. With your kids, if your kids are smoking a little bit of this high-grade weed at a party, their inhibitions are dropped, and I come up and say, here, Tim, try this pill. Snort this line. And it's benzos or opiates, Pandora's box is open. They would have never done it in the first place if they weren't smoking the weed. Now let me explain opiates to you. When I say opiates, 
hydrocodone, Vicodin, Percocet, Percodan, Demerol, Dilaudid, Oxycontin, Oxymorphine, Loratab, Methadone, Suboxin, Heroin, Fentanyl, and a bunch of other stuff I forgot. That's all opiates. If I lock the doors in here right now and we all did opiates for a week straight, every one of you sitting in here will be a full-blown opiate addict. Every one of you. That's how powerful opiates are. 95% of the people that get hooked on opiates never get clean and sober. 95%. They end up in two places. Jail if they're lucky or dead. DuPage County where I live, 2015, there's 36 overdose deaths. 2017, there's 95. 95. I think Rob Russell a couple years ago at 22, I think you're at 52 right now. 52, right here. Youngest heroin addict I've worked with is how old, folks? 12. The oldest? 78. This affects everyone. Doesn't matter your demographics, your financial status, your race, your creed. This shit does not discriminate. Not at all. To be aware is to be alive. Just wanted to give you a little analogy on that. That one bag of heroin turned into a lot more. I swore I'd never use a needle. Five years later, I was sticking a needle in my arm probably 30 times a day. I worked, I functioned, I ran businesses, I made lots of money. I ran a multi-million dollar consulting firm. My largest client was Conagra Foods. I ran the largest SAP implementation in the world in 2002. I entire, hired the entire team and I recruited everyone. And I was making money hand over fist and my heroin habit was escalating, escalating, escalating. And I'd overdose occasionally in this. And then I got a second DUI and then I quit driving and a week before I was to get my license back, I drove once. I got pulled over by the Blue Island Chief of Police, off duty in his pickup truck for not using a turn signal. So now I lose it for two more years. I spoke last week in Kankakee, Illinois, and that man was sitting in the audience. He said, I remember you, you smart ass. I said, Yeah, you put on about 100 pounds since I saw you. But that's okay, he's retired. Um, God's got another funny sense of humor. Two weeks later, I got pulled over in Chicago by Officer White. And I dressed like this to go buy heroin because I was dealing really high. I was the ultimate chameleon. I could go negotiate a million dollar business deal, but then I could go hang with the gang chief, the maniac Latin disciple street gang on the west side of Chicago. And believe me, I was the only person going into this man's home with his family. I thought he was my friend, but I spent a lot of money. I'm a block away from Ray's house and I'm dressed like this and Officer White comes up and What are you doing? I said, man, I work for Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm on a 12-step pace call. He goes, uh, kid, nobody works for Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a volunteer program. You're going to buy drugs. No, I'm not. Search me. And he wrote me two tickets, and he said, I'm going to tell you, you better quit driving. And that got me 30 days in Cook County Jail, and it was just part of the game. Six months later, I got pulled over in Plainfield, did 30 days in Will County, and then two months later, I got pulled over in Chicago again in a different car in a different part of the city. By who? Officer White. Who gets pulled over by the same Chicago cop twice, eight months apart, two different cars? I do. There's three and a half million people in Chicago. That's God's sense of humor. See, he was throwing me a life raft, and I didn't grab on. That got me my first year in prison. January 25th of 2008, which is today, I was sentenced to a year in prison on my wife's birthday. I remember going to prison the first time, they give you a year, but you're going to do 61 days and they release you. And I'm at NRC, State Bowl Correctional Center, and you're locked down 24 hours a day until they figure out what prison they're going to send you to. And my beautiful daughter, Abby, turned 6 to 7, and I couldn't call her. My son, Max, turned 10 to 11, and I couldn't call him. And I swore I'd never do this again. And I <clears throat> got out 61, 64 days later. And I remember my wife Shannon sitting me down and saying, Tim, you know, while you were in prison, I applied for a Dunham scholarship to go to nursing school. And I said, you don't need to work. I make plenty of money. She said, Tim, the way you're living, you're going to end up in two places. You're going to end up dead or in prison. 
we got four kids to take care of it. She said, oh, I was number one out of the applicants. I got a full ride. I'm going to nursing school. You know, that lady worked full time, took care of her four kids, graduated top of her class in three years. Do you think I showed up to her graduation? No. I was dope sick. See, when you don't have opiates, you're profusely sick. It's like having the flu times a thousand. You're hot, you're cold, you're this, you're that. And uh, I opted not to go. One of my biggest regrets ever. December 16th of 2010, I opted to drive one more time. I drove to Chicago, bought some heroin. My dealer said, be careful, it's pure. I snorted a little bit, I drove away. If it's that good, I might as well shoot some off. I pulled into a McDonald's on North Avenue in Grand, shot up a bunch of heroin, put my stuff away, said I'm not dead, and I started driving. And uh, next thing I remember, I'm being wheeled on a gurney into West Suburban Hospital. Uh, I put four people in the hospital, one being a nine-month-old baby. I could have killed all four of those people. By the grace of God, they're all okay. The drug Narcan, which is in all your police departments, it's in this high school. Narcan is a tool to save a life. It reverses the effects of an opiate overdose. The opiates block the brain receptors and you stop breathing. If somebody injects it or puts it up their nose, it will pull them out of the overdose and you get 10, 15 minutes to get them to the hospital. That was administered to me five times. I was clinically dead four to eight minutes. I shouldn't be standing there. God and I got a good deal worked out though. I spent a week in Cook County Jail, got out. My wife picked me up at two in the morning. <coughs> Tim, tell that kid to quit crying. What did you mean? I'm doing something. <laughs> I'm only joking. Well, you, you're like me. You're a breeder, huh? How many kids you got now, Timmy? Four? Going for five? <laughs> Snippity snip. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you that story, too. <laughs> See, actually, I will tell you the story. When uh, I was set up to go get a vasectomy, and I took up the sport of skydiving. And I was in one of my sober bits, so I called my surgeon. I said, yeah, I'm going to put that off. I'm going to the drop zone. It's really a nice day. He said, all right, boom, next time she's pregnant with Abby. So I don't know. I'm glad Abby came along. So I'll tell you about Mackenzie. She came along, too. Um, yeah, I got all these crazy stories. Shannon picks me up. We drive back to Oswego, not a word said. We pull into our garage, go into my home office. And of course, my famous words are, honey, I'm sorry. I said, Tim, you're sorry now. We'll talk in the morning. As my wife was going up, I said, hey, do you know where my glasses are when I overdosed the airbag went off? She said, I went to Chicago. I got, went to the van. Your glasses are on the desk. Your coat's in the closet. And she turned away. She said, oh, good job, Father of the Year. You do know all your the kids' Christmas presents were in the back of the van, and half of them were missing, and I don't have money to buy them new ones. She went up to bed. I went to my closet, got my coat, opened up my coat pocket. There was my five grams of heroin. The cops never found one picture. No. Because that's what drug addicts do. I just want to feel normal. I don't want to get high, I want to feel normal. One got the best lawyer, gave him a $30,000 retainer, and said, let's beat this. He said, Tim, uh, you're not beating that. He said, you're going to prison again. It's just a matter of for how long. I'll see what I could do. I'm to a point in my life where I want to die. But I was raised Catholic, I'm kind of a recovering Catholic, hell, purgatory, all this crazy ass stuff. I don't want to hang out there for the rest of my life so I wouldn't put a gun in my mouth and blow my head off. But I will shoot five grams of heroin in my arm every day, hoping to die or hoping not to wake up from an overdose. Because that's what this disease does to you. I started to fight my case and about three months into fighting my case, I'm profusely sick so I'm taking a hot bath. and. My 17-year-old son, Nick, comes in the bathroom. He said, what's wrong, Pops? I said, what do you think, you idiot? I'm dope sick. He said, no more, Dad. Today's your lucky day. And Nick threw two bags of heroin on the counter. You got to understand with my son, Nick, I was not a father. I was a friend. And I guarantee you there's a few people here that will change their attitudes on being friends with your kids. I'm going to tell you right now, especially mothers, you are not your daughter's friend. You are a mother or you are a father. Quit playing friends with your kids. You're not their friend. Don't act like you're a friend. Don't play friends with your children. Probably in the day, there are some parents here that your parents let you drink some beer at home. Don't do that. <clears throat> Absolutely do not do that. 
because that's what I did. I went naked in his buddies, drank a little bit in the basement, smoked some weed. Of course, I'm off shooting heroin they didn't know about. So after I hit the cars, now Nick knows I'm a drug addict, heroin addict. And he threw two bags of heroin on the counter. I went and did them. I went in his room. I said, Nick, what the hell are you doing? Don't worry, Dad, I'm just selling a little bit. I said, Nick, you need to shut this down immediately. You know what this drug has done to me. My son looked right at me and said, well, Dad, you're a successful drug addict. Why the hell would you say that? We got a nice house, got an office in the Wrigley building, you make a good living. See, my son's delusional mind because I function, he thought I was successful. Three months later, my son and I were doing heroin together. That's where the disease of addiction takes you. That's how my son and I bonded, getting high together, doing drugs. October 30th, 2012, I was sentenced to seven years in the Illinois Department of Corrections. When I walked into prison the second time, I weighed 158 pounds. I had skin and bone. I was walking death. I defecated and vomited myself in a cell for two weeks straight. And that's where I looked up. All right, God, you're up there. Please take away this obsession and compulsion to use. And I swear I will turn my will and life over to you. And please let me get into Sheridan Prison. Son of a gun, next day I was transferred to Sheridan Prison. I did not sleep a wink for 30 days. It took me another three months to be able to sleep two hours straight. It took me another three to four months to be able to sleep four hours straight. And ravage my body. Sheridan Correctional Center is one of 28 prisons in Illinois. We have two pr programs with therapeutic drug treatment programs. They have one. I was probably the happiest inmate to walk into that prison. 18 hours a day, Big Perk, my cellmate, former unknown vice or gang chief for 25 years, had spent 23 years behind the wall. All we did was study the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, the Bible, the NA basic text, went through the 12 steps, he'd write letters to my son, Nick, an act of addiction, that man helped save my life. So don't ever judge a book by its cover, ever. My wife of 18 years divorced me, lost her home in foreclosure, displaced my wife and four kids. I ended up only doing 13 and a half months. <laughs> God's got another funny sense of humor. I caught my case. December 16th of 2010. I walked out of prison December 16th, 2013. Three years of the day I caught the case and walked out of the joint. First time in my life, 13 and a half months clean and sober. Shannon picked me up, took me to downtown Naperville to my townhouse where my mom and Redden set up for me. All our furniture was in there. Nick, Max, Tanner, and Abby came over for dinner that night. Got my dog Cabo. And that's the last time I was together with my former wife and four kids as a family. I plugged into recovery, got another sponsor, went through the steps again, commuted four and a half hours a day to go to work. And back in the technology space, three months later, I set up a Man Recovery Foundation. We got to direct people into treatment. I met people like Matt Quinn, started referring people to Rosecrans, CDH, just helping people. I stumbled into getting a job in the treatment space. At 19 months sober, Nick was back in treatment for the fifth or sixth time. I went to meet with my son. He's like, Dad, man, we got such a crazy story. We're going to go speak all over the country. I said, Bud, I love it. But you got to get sober, Nick. Don't worry, Dad, I will. 30 days out of treatment, he's back in Cook County Jail, selling, selling bogus pills, trying to buy heroin. He did 45, he actually did 30 days there, got transferred to Kane County to do another 15 days because one time he had overdosed and spit in an ambulance driver's face go on the way to Del Nor Hospital. And he got out. And Shannon picked them up, fed them, said, Nick, we're done. You're not coming to my house. You're not coming to Dad's. You lie, cheat, and steal. Don't worry, got it all figured out. My girlfriend and I are getting an apartment. Five days out of jail, I called Nick, and I said, Nick, come to my house and get some Narcan. It's three and a half years ago, I did a huge Narcan training event. Back then, police, not many law enforcement had it. Paramedics did. We were handing it out like candy. He says, Dad, don't worry, I'm not on that BS anymore. And I believed him. And two days later, Friday, Friday August 1st, 2014, Shannon called me at 6 in the morning and said, I'm coming to get you, Nick, overdosed again. She picked me up. We shot to Hinsdale Hospital. We ran into the emergency room. Tim and Shannon Ryan here to see our son, Nick. He overdosed. And 30 seconds later, the chaplain walked out. I knew my son was dead. What was my next thought? Anybody, say it. Say it. <laughs> two, two things. It's my fault, or you wanted to go get high. My first thought was I'll be at 6 o'clock, 12 step meeting that night. That's what I did. I went to a meeting. 
My son Nick died at my 21 month sobriety date. I'll be the first person to stand here and tell you I helped kill my own son. I have to live with that for the rest of my life. I didn't start him on heroin, he followed in my footsteps, we ultimately did it together. There's no rationalization, there's no justification. I helped kill my own son. This is why I carry my son today. I carry his ashes in this necklace. Ride or die, I live next will and God's will to the best of my ability every day. I went to a 12-step meeting that night and I never looked back. I'm a little over five years clean and sober today. Since Nick died, I've buried 121 people. Robin, you mind standing up? It's my friend Robin Dale. I buried her son Matt a month ago. Jennifer, where are you at? Stand up. I buried her daughter a little over a year ago. Wonderful children. Most outgoing kids in the world. I don't look at my son Nick as a drug addict. I look at him as a skateboarder, the kid that lit up the room, that made some bad choices, as did all of our kids. And the disease of addiction took our children. And it will take years if you are not aware to what's going on. The hardest thing for a family to do is ask for help. When the hell is my phone? <laughs> Hello? No, I'm joking. How many of your kids got these? How many of you drown your children and take these away? How many of you monitor your kids' cell phones? How? Get on, it and check it. Get on it and check it so if they delete it, you don't know what the hell they deleted, do you? That's true. Who else monitors them? Boy, the hands go down real quick. <laughs> you guys are just like the students. Yes, ma'am, how do you do it? Good. First off, do not ever let your children charge these in their bedroom at night, ever. I don't care how old they are. Let me explain something to you. You're responsible for what goes on in this phone. You pay the bill, your house, your rules. If you don't know your kid's password, shut the phone off, throw it in the garbage. There is no privacy for children. Zero. You can write down a website called Be Sure Consulting. B-E-S-U-R-E -E Consulting. Or afterwards, I'll give it to you again. You can grab a card. I'll send you an email. Be sure consulting. That's my partner, Detective Rich Wastocki, retired from the Naperville Police Department Friday. You can go to his website, and there is software that you can download. You're better to have an Android than an Apple, but we can still get you help there. It's where you can mirror your kid's cell phone. Every picture, text message, Snapchat, everything they do, even if they delete it, you can see it. We can give you computer software that tracks 2,600 different words of sexual nature, bullying, and drug related. And I want to talk to you about drug testing. Anyone here ever drug tested their kids? Who put their hand up? Put that hand back up. Were they dirty? What did you do? So what I will say, mothers, you got that intuition, your moms. That other guy sits in the lazy point and just does not much anything. <laughs> so I'll go with the moms here. You got that intuition. If something's wrong, something's wrong. If you're going to drug test your kids, you better have a plan of action in place. You better get to know people like Matt Quinn and some of the other people here from the organizations. Whether it's counseling, they need treatment. Two of my kids have been through Rosecrans. It's one of the greatest adolescent programs in the United States of America. People from all over the country come here. But if you're going to drug test them, if it's a little weed, do they need inpatient? I don't know. I'll let the clinician figure it out. But if they need therapy or follow-up, if there's other things, damn right they do. But there's families sitting in this audience that might have really good insurance, they might be on state insurance or might not have any. We can help you. There's resources. We can get you in 
but you need to know what to do. You need to know who the hell your kids' friends are. How many parents truly know who their kids' friends are? You met them all, you vet them. You need to, because <laughs> you understand that who's got a daughter? Who's got a 17, 18 year old daughter? You got that 17, 18 year old daughter, or boyfriend comes over to pick him up in his car, your daughter's going to be going to college, and Officer Friendly pulls him over, and boyfriend's got some acid, some Xanax, some whatever. Uh, they're both getting arrested. Both of them are getting charged. To be aware is to be alive. And how do you do that? By knowing who your kids' friends are and being in their technology, looking at their Instagram, their Snapchat, and if they start talking, they're lying. They're lying. Their lips are moving, they're lying. <laughs> well, let me tell you, uh, mom, dad, no. There's an issue. But it's having open communication with your kids. My sex talks was, I hope you wear rubbers. Okay, ma. Oh, let's get back to that. Um, so I get out of prison. I meet my future wife at a meeting. Well, 13 step for Tim. Uh, she was married. I ended up leaving her husband with me. And all of a sudden, I heard that again. Uh, I'm pregnant. I said, what? I'm 46 years old. You are not pregnant. I said, it's not mine. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Well, all right. Yes, I'll drag you down to the courthouse to marry you, too. And I've got a little two-and-a-half-year-old daughter, Mackenzie. God called one home, blessed me with another. My daughter has never seen her dad drink or eat his drugs. My daughter's my world. I get to spend every day with my 19-year-old son. We travel the country, he films, my other son edits videos. My 16-year-old daughter is a straight-A student. I've got a good life today, but I squandered it for a long time. I'm sick and tired of burying people. I need people to know what's going on. This is your community. The police here, they don't want to arrest your kids. They want to help them. We can't arrest our way out of this problem. Do you realize that the number one killer in the United States of America is opioid overdoses? 65,000 people. That's more than car accidents and gun violence Combined, do you know what the average heroin addict is today? Let me tell you, 22 year old white middle class female and a 23 year old white middle class male. From where? Geneva, Illinois, Naperville, Illinois, Wheaton, Illinois, Chris Lake, Illinois, Tupelupa, Mississippi, everywhere. This does not discriminate, it's here. When I spoke to your students yesterday, and I'll end with this, and then we'll do the panel. When I spoke to all the students yesterday, I did all classes, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. And this will shock you, and it shocked Tom. I told all the kids to put their heads down. And I said, I don't care who's here, cops, teachers, put your hand up if you got a friend that smokes weed. 90% of the hands went up. And this is from freshman up. Now put your hands up if you got a buddy that drinks. Damn near every hand went up. I said, now put your hand up if you got a friend that does Xanax bars. Benzodiazepines, three quarters of the hands went up. Now put your hand up if you got a friend that does illegal pain pills. Half the hands went up. Now put your hand up if you have a friend that's done heroin. Third of the hands went up. These are your students right here. That's real talk. How many of you have unused prescription pain meds at home right now? Put your hands up. You won't get Put them up so we can see them, class. <laughs> you have them. Why? Why? Kidney stones. Why? Kidney stones. <laughs> okay, do you still got the kidney stones? <laughs> no, but I'm terrified of getting them. My back was hurt, but I want to keep them around. You guys got disposal boxes here? Yes. Take that stuff to the police department tomorrow and dispose of all of it. Want to know why? Because if my son Max, some of his Yahoo friends come to your house to cut your lawn or they're your kids' good friends, hey, can I use your bathroom? Sure. Up there, right from through your medicine cabinet, taking it all. If you don't need them, get rid of them. If you need them again, go to the damn doctor. That's where it all starts. Kids taking the prescription meds right out of your cabinet. 
right out of it. We will talk about more. That's a little bit of my journey, my story. Tim Naylor, stand up again. Who saw my TV show Dope Man on A&E? Boy, well, you got some stinkers. <laughs> Who's got Amazon Prime at home? Good, now you can all go home and watch it tonight. <laughs> but without Tim Naylor from Geneva, Illinois, I would not have had that TV show. He found me three and a half years ago. We've become near and dear friends. We're working on a lot of things together. Uh, great man, I thank you, Tim. I love you, brother. Um, I have had some cool things happen in recovery. Who's been at the State of the Union address? <laughs> Didn't think so. I have. Oh, you too? Rock and roll. Two of us. <laughs> but I'm the ex con and got to go. <laughs> were, were you wrote up in Newsweek magazine as one of the 18 most interesting guests? Didn't think so. <laughs> Steve Harvey Show, Dr. Drew, Lisa Lang. I just wrote up in Real Leaders magazine, which goes to 25,000 of the top CEOs in the world in 130 countries as one of the 100 top thought leaders of 2017. I got some neat things going on. But the most important thing in my life is my recovery, my relationship with God, then everything else I do falls into place. Please, afterwards, Ask the questions. We'll be out here to meet and talk. I got my books. We got a ton of resources. My name is Tim Ryan, great for recovery and alcohol and drug addict. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Is the microphone on? Yes? Okay. Now we're going to shift to our panel, and while I'm introducing our uh, panel that's going to share their experiences with us from a local perspective, uh, the, the deans from Geneva High School are going to make their way up the aisles. If you want to pass your note cards, if you have some questions you would like to submit to us to be asked, feel free to pass those to the aisles and we will put my back one out. Back. All right, so Joining Tim on stage at this time from the Geneva Police Department, Detective Joe Sergeant Mike Freers. Welcome, Freers. Welcome, Detective Freers. Thank you. From the King County Sheriff's Department, Sergeant Aaron Faza. And Tim mentioned his name a moment ago. From Rosecrans Health Network, Mr. Matt Quinn. of these gentlemen to do for the next few minutes is to share a little bit of what they are seeing and hearing and uh, what they think you need to know about, for example, what the Geneva Police Department is seeing in the community. Uh, I know Matt Quinn can share what those grants can do to help families and help your, your children. So we're going to work our way down the line and we'll start with Detective Sergeant Freeders, if you don't mind. Is this working? Can you hear me? There we go. Oh, I think I picked the wrong seat. <laughs> <laughs> Should have been a hard left. Um, whatever he says, believe. Uh, what we see is what he says. Uh, this is not a big city problem. This is not your neighbor's problem. This is not somebody else's problem. This is what we see every day. Um, in regards to what generally we run into, um, especially when he speaks of uh, cannabis use, marijuana use, it's prolific. Uh, what I would describe as a change in mindset after last year where the state of Illinois has moved towards that trend of other states where we continue to change our philosophy, uh, generally speaking, on what the dangers of cannabis are, uh, we see that daily. Uh, we are constantly We've probably written some of your kids' cannabis tickets. Sometimes we write them four, five, six cannabis tickets, where in the old days we would arrest them, and we saw fewer and fewer of those. Again, cannabis lowers your inhibitions. Uh, there was just a study that was released, I believe, early this week or last week, that talked about we are not truly adults <coughs> until the age of 25. Did anybody else see that? Okay. The age of 25. The state of Illinois is in serious discussions right now 
about raising the age of what is a juvenile from the age of 18 up to the age of 25. Now imagine that, your high school kid is a juvenile until he's 25, he or she. I mean, that, they're never going away. I mean, I'm gonna be working until I'm 110. I'll need a walker to get out of the police car. Um, your kids aren't mature enough to make those kind of decisions, especially if they're under the influence. So those things that he talked about are the things that we see on a daily basis. Be engaged, be involved, um, interact with them, be active as a parent. Thank you. Sergeant Faiso. Forgive me, I, I, I'm getting over strep throat so I can't talk very loud. <laughs> Uh, my name is Aaron Faiza. I'm the detective sergeant at the King County Sheriff's Office. Um, we're currently uh, spearheading a, it's titled the King County Heroin Initiative. Uh, Sheriff Kramer, who is here with us, has been kind enough to partner up with DEA Chicago, who's also here with us today, Group Supervisor Todd Smith. Uh, and we're trying to spearhead the heroin problem in our county because it is here. I, when, when Tim mentioned the stats earlier about uh, you know the kids Xanax, uh, op any opiates, and I heard I could I could hear you guys gasping. It is here, believe me. Um, I've been a cop for 16 years. I've been a drug cop for 10 of those, and it's here. I have bought heroin from kids from Geneva High School. It's here. Um, the, the, what I want to share with you guys is going to be mostly out at the table outside. I'm going to encourage all you guys to stop by. Um, what to look for as parents. Cell phones is huge, like Tim touched on. Um, also, iPass. You know, the kids are going into the west side of Chicago. They're getting their buddies together. They're, they're splitting up. They're throwing their money together, uh, and they're buying heroin, and they're coming out here and they're making money to support their habit. Um, it is happening. It's happening here. Uh, encourage, again, I encourage you all to come to the table. Uh, I have some handouts. I have pictures. Um, I have my business cards out there. I want, it's got my personal cell phone number on there. If you guys have a problem and you want to talk to a cop about it, Call me 24 7. I don't care. Um, it is an epidemic and it's getting worse and worse every year. Uh, the fact that the president is specifically talking about the opioid epidemic, uh, that says something. We can't pretend that it's not in Geneva, that it's not in St. Charles, Dave, because it is here. It's not just Aurora, it's not just Belgium, it's everywhere. Um, and parents, now, you're the first line of defense, so I'm going to ask again that you please stop by my uh, table outside. Todd's going to be there from the DEA. Uh, we have handouts. I will show you what to look for, um, give you some tips as parents on uh, what you can do to, to uh, keep your kids clean and help us out. Good evening, everybody. This is a great room. I, I have to say before I, and I gotta, I gotta be careful, Tim gets me fired up, so I gotta <clears throat> make sure that I'm keeping it short. Um, I can't tell you how impressed I am by how many people have turned out, by the administration. Obviously, it takes a lot of effort. I, I do events like these all the time. It takes a lot of effort to make this happen. Uh, last night, I, w I was at an event. I'm not gonna say the town. Far enough away that I'm hoping nobody was there. I'm pretty sure nobody was there. There were 10 people. How many multiples of 10 are here? You guys should be proud of that. You know, I know, I know as parents you want the best for your kids, and it's really important that they grow up happy and healthy. All I would say is after 15 years of direct work with teenagers and their families, kids that are struggling with drugs and alcohol, 
is be careful. Be careful of the, at least it's only. That's my tagline. Minimizing. At least it's only. How many of you thought that? At least it's only vaping. We haven't talked about that yet. At least it's only marijuana. At least it's only alcohol. I can't tell you how many kids I've worked with where the kid for sure, and sometimes the parents, I could tell, they wouldn't say it, but you could tell by how they were behaving, they were thinking the, at least it's only. And 15 years of experience, a lot of those kids overdosed and died because of the it's only. Matt, you're old. It's, it's just weak. You're out of touch. I heard that. There's a, a, his voice rings in my head, and he's, he's no longer with us. Be careful with the it's, it's just only, because that's how this all starts, right? Be the parent that parents based on research, on science, brain develop, right? Somebody mentioned 25, right? right? Marijuana, alcohol, nicotine from vaping, it all does incredible damage to all different parts of the brain. Teenagers using are at much higher risk. All, there's multiple, multiple research studies that back this up. Teenagers that use alcohol and other drugs are at much higher risk of de developing addictions later on. Please don't, don't parent based on an outdated model of, well, I did it, it's okay. I want, my, I want my kid to be safe, drink my own home. I want to get them ready for drinking for college. These are naive attitudes. Please, please don't think that way because that's how this all starts. Use a current model, brain science, risk for addiction. Base your boundaries on that. And, and what you should base your boundaries on. Not on trying to be cool, trying to, you know, you, you, want your parent, you want your kid to fit in, you want them to be accepted. That's all true, but there's ways to go about that other than being the type of parent that goes along with those types of mentality. So I'm going to cut myself off. I'm going, I'm going too far, but thank you for having me and thanks for showing up. Thank time we are going to rotate back and forth. If there are people in the audience who want to ask a question, we are recording this uh, thanks to our GTV studio and Mr. Jason Santo, the teacher in that program. We will have this uh, program available for people who are unable to join us tonight. What we'd like to do is have a microphone in your hand so that everybody in the audience can hear it and so it can be recorded on our program. So we're going to bring a microphone to you. So if you'd like to ask a question from the audience, raise your hand. We'll bring a microphone to you. If you're not comfortable doing that, that's okay. I've got a large stack of questions right here. So raise your hand if you want someone to bring a microphone to you. Otherwise, I'll start with some questions. Uh, first one here, what type, what treatment options are available besides full rehab? Matt, maybe that's for you. Yeah, absolutely, I'll take that one. Um, there's plenty of options. Again, out, out, there's tables out there in terms of outpatient programs right here in Geneva. Uh, outpatient therapists, we have individual therapists represented. Where's Kim Boatner, is he out there? Right, uh, we have Nathan Lantern, Lighthouse. We have we have plenty of outpatient out, uh, uh, services right in your community that are available. What I would do is hit all of the services, grab grab something from every table, take a look through it because there's plenty of other options in the community. We have an outpatient office in Naperville with Rosecrans. We have our 80 bed uh, inpatient facility out in Rockford, um, but there's plenty plenty of services um, that are out there right in right in the community here. You basically have inpatient residential, partial hospitalization where they're going six hours a day, five days a week, intensive outpatient, which could be three hours a day, five days a week, three days a week, one-on-one. -on -one. You know, there's tons of resources out there. What I do is I'm kind of the concierge. I know where to guide and direct good therapists, what's here in your community, and you got to talk, you got to ask, and do your due diligence and your research. And I'll give kudos to the school district as well. Use those tools around you. You know, you live in Geneva because this is a great community. They provide great services. The counseling services at the high school here, but now your school, each one has counseling services available to your students. Phenomenal. Use those resources. Um, here at the police department, we contract out and have our own victim services. So if we interact with your young person or you, we can refer you and push you off to counseling. So it's, it's using maybe that first step, getting your leg in, and then you can move up from that. And if you've got a child getting help, get yourself some help too. Don't put all the onus on them. Go get yourself some therapy or counseling or support groups. I'll stop. I think somebody's got the microphone. <coughs> Go right ahead. Um, you had mentioned that you have to stop by your um, stand and you would provide tips. But can you 
Tom, is there a way to make those tips to available, like through, you know, the online, not really the online backpack, but for everybody? Because I think, you know, what to look for is so important for so many of the parents who aren't here today. Yes, and we talked about the fact that the 12 organizations that are in the cafeteria, we're going to gather as much information as we can from them, and we're going to post that on our website along with the video. We're going to provide as much follow-up as we can. Uh, so, yes, we'll, we'll do our best to, to work with all those organizations. Anything they'll give us, we will provide. The DEA's, DEA's website is great as well. So if you go to the DEA's website, you know it's a credible government entity. You're not going to get a mishmash of, well, I did a study and I don't think marijuana is that bad. Um, you're going to get a, a scientific-based, reality-based uh, perspective on what to look for. You can look up any drug, some of those kind of key factors. That's a good reference to as well. Uh, the next question. Mr. Rogers? Yes, sir. Uh, oh. This is the book. <laughs> Excuse me for interrupting. Uh, Go right ahead. Panelists, my name is Kevin Burns. I'm a 1982 graduate of Geneva High School. Based on your comments you just mentioned regarding outpatient and inpatient services available here in Geneva, I would love to hear your professional comments regarding the debates we see in neighboring communities, in particular due west of here in the lovely community of Campton Hills and due east of here in the equally lovely community of Wheaton who are fighting tooth and nail to have an outpatient clinic built in their communities despite the growing opioid crisis. I'll start on that because I was at Wheaton two or three weeks ago. Haymarket, which is one of the largest treatment centers in the state of Illinois, is trying to open a 16-bed inpatient residential with a MAT outpatient program, which is medically assisted treatment, methadone, suboxone, Vivitrol shot for, for opiate addicts. And those are tools to, to save a life, and, and you can't save someone if they're friggin' dead. Um, it's as simple as that, but I got up, it, it was really crazy at that event because I signed up to speak and an anesthesiologist got up before me and said, I work in this community and you don't want those IV drug users walking down your street. The ignorance blows my doors off. This is a progressive and chronic, if we won't open cancer centers of America, we'd open one in every freaking community. We want a dialysis center, we'll open them up everywhere. But we don't want those people in our neighborhood. Those people are your moms, dads, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins, nieces, nephews. You know, there was one trying to open in Campton. There was one trying to open up in uh, Elburn. And what else is needed is sober homes. A lot of places don't want those people living in your backyard. It, it's sad. It's really sad because there's not enough beds out there, you know, and resources for people. There just isn't. Uh, before we go on to it, yeah, I was going to say, do you mind if I just say oh, one more thing? Yeah, yeah. You have to understand a lot of people don't ask for help. For a, the, one of the biggest reasons why people don't ask for help is because there is still that stigma with addiction. I, I wish it wasn't true, but there is. When we went to open our 30 bed adult recovery home down in Lakeview, down in Chicago, the amount of resistance that we got from that community um, on the park benches, they would put signs saying you might be sitting next to an addict. You know, fortunately for us, we were able to spin that around and, and, and put signs over it saying a person. These they just people. put Tim's picture. Yeah. <laughs> He's an addict. <laughs> but it's, it's really important to realize, and this is why anytime I, last week I did a presentation for a whole bunch of police officers, the f first and foremost, we have to understand that this is a brain, a brain disease that's probably most similar to heart disease if you're going to compare it to anything. So you have to understand that if you're approaching it from, as a society, we're still thinking of it as we will, yeah. or we're still thinking of it as a bad moral, choice, moral, it's a moral choice. corruption, yeah. we're not going to get anywhere. This has to start with a change in the perception of what this is. Once we do that, then everything, the dominoes will start to fall. And, and people debate the chicken or the egg. Go ahead and clap for Matt. He's Thank you. Thanks, Allison Johnson. They might have made a choice because they were smoking some good weed and tried something, but then they unleashed a monster. Believe me, I would be driving to Chicago, crying, wanting to be home with my wife and four kids, but to pull that, I just want to feel normal. And, and there's no stopping, but uh, yeah. And if I may, we have to get over the stigma that the opiate addict is a homeless gangbanger with tattoos all over his face. 
that's going to break into your house, and, and that's not the case. That's the biggest. 22-year-old white middle class female, 23-year-old white middle not class female. That, that's your average heroin addict. Uh, before we go back to the audience, uh, Matt re referenced vaping a moment ago, and there's a question here from someone in the audience that wants to know what's the difference between vaping and hits. Well, hit, hits is like the verb. That's what you do with the vape. vape I mean, va vaping is kind of like an overall general term, whereas taking a hit is like inhaling from a vapor. I or mean, a bong. A lot of these are synonymous. It could be from a bong, or it could be a, a hit of a bag of dope, or whatever. It's, it's slang. There, there's a bunch of slang out there. But when I spoke to the kids yesterday, I asked them how many of them had a friend that vaped. Time 80% 80, 80 of the hands went up. And this is from freshmen up. As parents, couple things. Do not ever tell your kids what you did in high school or college. Why do Because as soon as you say, well, I tried cocaine or I smoked some weed, you've just lost all defenses. Well, Dad, you did it. Mom, you did it. You told me you did it. You're dead in the water. Yes, you lie to them. Search your damn rooms or cars. Go through their stuff. Be the snoop of snoops. To be aware is to be alive. You have that right as a parent. And on that line of it's only, um, we as law enforcement, we've been enforcing tobacco laws, just straight tobacco, kids smoking cigarettes, since the mid-80s. And there's been plenty of studies, studies after study, that says if we can stop kids from smoking cigarettes, we can keep them from moving on to other things. Because I'm generally speaking, if I'm going to smoke weed, I'm not smoking weed. Where do, I, where do I train myself on how to smoke weed? I either have a friend that does it and or I'm smoking cigarettes. So I start, I do that, I'm vaping, I'm smoking cigarettes, then I'm moving on to other things. So that's why we have an aggressive tobacco pro, um, enforcement program. We try and nip all of those things in the bud. You don't want your kids doing those things. And one thing I want to hit on that that's brought up, um, Who's heard of the dark web or the dark net? Do you know your kids can get right onto the dark web and order drugs off the internet and have it shipped by U.S. mail right to your house? Xanax, research chemicals, heroin, pills, right to your house. They can order juice for their vape that they will get high off of, that they can order. And it's completely untraceable. So if you're not in their technology, you don't know what's going on and the stuff's deadly. I was in Georgia three months ago. A kid had ordered Xanax off the internet. Him and nine of his buddies each took a pill of Xanax. It was all pressed fentanyl. Killed every one of them. Killed every one of them. And if you see a thing about this long, about four inches long, and it's black, and it looks like a USB port, it's funny, I'll go to schools and they have boxes of vapes. And they'll have a different box with eyeglasses and cell phones, and then they have these USB ports. They have all these USB ports. There are students in there, they, the students in here know where I'm going with this, right? It's called a Juul, and it's one of the most common types of vapes out there. Uh, there's also another brand called Fix. You, gotta, you guys have to be current at the table. I have some updated terminology. You've got to be current with this stuff, or else it's going to go right over your head, and you're going to say, oh, wow, that's a, that's a nice big uh, USB. It's, you know, they're doing a lot of work and storing a lot of stuff on that USB. <laughs> it's not a USB. It's a Juul. It's a vaping device. And look at the... Detective Wasaki from Naperville was in on a DOA, and it was a, a young girl, and she had heroin foils all over her car. And, and he said to the parents, do you not see what this is? Oh, we thought our daughter chewed a lot of chewing gum. It's tinfoil that the heroin's wrapped up in. To be aware is to be alive. Back up to the audience. Yeah, Tom, you talked about vaping and, you know, cigarettes and other things that could be vaped. What's the, you know, how is that different? You know, I never knew you could vape other types of drugs other than tobacco. And is it, you know, is it stronger? Does it work stronger like that? I can touch on that. Um, <clears throat> back in the day, you'd go in your kid's room and you'd look for that bag of weed. Typically, you're not going to find that anymore. You're going to find, uh, Sometimes it's called wax. It literally looks like blobs of earwax, that pure THC, that they put in the, the vape pens, and they, it's smokeless. Um, so if you're just looking for that bag of weed, you're not always going to find it. It's, it's, there's things called dabs, which it's a piece of wax paper with uh, pretty much pure THC concentrate. Looks like a little spot of uh, 
caramel. And I just take a little bit of that and heat it up, and uh, it's 100 times powerful than regular wheat. So uh, if you're just looking for the, I mean, regular wheat is still out there, but uh, a lot of the kids aren't buying that now. They're, buying, they're going to the, the liquids, or they're going to the wax. The research the chemicals that won't even show up in a drug test. But you know, it's uh, knowledge have, is power. I have photos of all that stuff at my table outside. And, and please realize that they're able to track from states like Colorado and Washington through, through seizures in the mail. They can track where this stuff's going. Anybody want to guess where Illinois ranks in terms of where this stuff in Colorado and Washington's going? Okay. Number one. Or two. 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 That means all this stuff's coming here. And if you think of Colorado, it's just fields where they're just growing marijuana. That's not the case. They're doing this in labs. They got sheets of wax and dabs. They got liquids. They got vape pens. That's all, that's all flooding in Animals. our state. All of that stuff's flooding in our state. So that, that, that the, the landscape has completely changed because of that. OK. Uh, there's a question. Stay on vaping for a second. How are you dealing with vaping? I'm assuming that's a question for us as a school administration. Um, I agree with Tim yesterday when he asked how many have a friend that's vaping, he said 80%. I would have gone higher. The kids kind of chuckled, to be honest with you, and said, yeah, of course. Um, we are doing our best to educate our teachers. We did that yesterday in a faculty meeting where we talked about the fact that that's not a big USB drive. If we did have a teacher early in the school year come to the dean's office and say, hey, I think a student lost their USB drive. <laughs> Uh, and it's true. So we're trying to be as current as we can be. Uh, vaping is treated in our student handbook, in our chemical use policy, the same as tobacco. So the, if you go home and look online at the uh, student handbook, you can see there are consequences for vaping. We are also alerting our teachers <coughs> that reports recently that kids are doing it in class. A lot of this stuff doesn't smell. Or it smells like grapes, or it smells like blueberries, or cotton candy. They have all these crazy flavors, and they're sticking the big USB drive, if we want to keep calling it that, in their sleeve, and they're inhaling from their sleeve, and then they can either exhale, because uh, we talked about it yesterday, the, the amount of vapor that they're exhaling with the new vape juice is, it doesn't produce as much, or they blow it down into their hooded sweatshirt. So we're doing our best to be vigilant, and we need to partner with you. Find those jewels. I can't get over the fact that we have kids, and people for that matter, that are inhaling things that we don't know anything about. You know, at least we know what tobacco is. We've heard all that research, and we all, we all society continues to ignore it. But to inhale this vape juice that nobody knows anything about, Tim yesterday described They were talking it. about a big buddy of mine, Michael Daly, owns all over this, and little medical particle, particles actually <laughs> come off and start filling your lungs and if you're a daily vapor your life expectancy can be about 10 years and there's no there's no fda regulation of that liquid none it's the wild wild west with that stuff and that but there's organizations harvard did a great study where they took 51 of the most common vaping devices 75 percent of them had a lot of the same carcinogens that you cigarettes. find in cigarettes and what about nicotine whatever nicotine is you guys have heard this right it's as addictive as heroin it's true so you're talking about 14, 15, 16 year olds doing something that's just as addictive as heroin and impacts you know, prefrontal cortex development like alcohol does. Again, be careful with the, at least it's only. It's, it's and dangerous for, forget the at least it's only. You ask any heroin addict where they started. Smoking cigarettes and smoking weed. Every one of them. There's a microphone in your box. There we go, go ahead. So I have three teenagers and heard a rumor. So I'm hoping that either the school can correct this rumor or the police can explain this to me. That a few years ago that there was a, a student here at Geneva High School who got busted for drugs, got hauled out of here, ended up in juvie because he was de a dealer. And then a couple of years later, he's back here at our school. And so it was explained to me by um, a teacher from a neighboring school district, because we are a public school, we cannot deny them education. I don't, that's I don't a, know. Oh, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. <laughs> I'll comment on that because I'm 
not going to get law enforcement stolen. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. But, <laughs> let me tell you, through my years of experience, four out of prison, whatever, you have to understand, kids, Matt and I are in a, we're, we're all in high school together. I might be the guy getting it and selling it to my buddies. Am I a dealer? When we say dealer, we're thinking pound. That's the guys in Chicago or the people that hide the drugs out here, but whether it's selling it or not, and he went to juvie, write what you're saying, you're stigmatizing this person. And I'm not trying to be a jerk, but you're automatically stig. Well, he's a dealer. Get him out of here. He's one of those people. You know what? He could have been a kid that came from a horseshit home, had a father that beat him every day, an older brother that turned him on to smoke and weed or whatever, and did this, got in some trouble. But do you know the stigma I get? Because I'm the father that did heroin with his son, and even though I turned my life around, Oswego, Illinois, is doing a huge event tonight, and they won't let me come into that community because I live there. My daughter goes to high school in Geneva. Her teacher's been asking for three years. They won't let me come in and speak to the health class because I'm that dad. Whether it happened or not, they know about it. We want to give this kid a shot to turn his life around. That's what I I'll also say you have to be careful with any time you preface your statement with, I heard this, uh, which we really lived in September. Fake uh, news. That <laughs> fake news is a reality. I mean, your device is uh, probably mostly fake news. So um, if we just d dissected a little bit, looked at what the, where does reality meet the story if the majority of the students that attend Geneva High School are juveniles in terms of what the law says. So a juvenile is anybody under the age of 18. So anybody up until the age of 17 goes through the juvenile justice system. The juvenile justice system isn't like adult court. When we get arrested, we go to traffic court, we have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt there are consequences for our actions for adults. When we're a kid, the juvenile justice system is based on what's called restorative justice. It tries to factor in all components of the kid, the family, the community, and how best can we address these issues full well knowing that this kid is probably not fully developed and is not an adult that can make a good decision. So even in the scenario, let's say it's a hardcore straight up drug dealer on the corner here selling outside the school and he goes through the juvenile justice system, that's not going to be the same thing as the adult system. Now. Will that student come back to the Geneva High School? There's a whole lot of realities that also have to pull it, go into place. And I, but I'll tell you this, this school is safe. The school does everything that it has to do to maintain a safe environment. This, the police department supports every endeavor. Mr. Rogers and I talk all the time. Actually, we don't. If we don't have to, we don't, because we don't. It's good not to see each other. Um, we have a police officer in your school. We have an active partnership. There is uh, arguably no safer school around. I would trust to send my own children. And I'll tell you, most of the drug dealers are somebody's older brother or sister. That's it. There's, they have active drug, you might have a kid give a pill here and there, but even if that kid was kicked out of this school and going to an alternative school, he's got the drugs, the kids are going to meet him outside the school. You want drugs, you're going to get them. And I can ask, I could go anywhere in the United States of America and within an hour, I can find any drug I want because they're everywhere. And I guarantee you, I'll tell you the same thing. It's, I'll go buy a little, I'll sell off the extra yep. to make enough to support my habit and maybe support my friends around me. What you think as what is the hardcore drug dealer is probably the friend selling off just enough to support himself. So that scenario from a school standpoint, what I was just going to add, from a school perspective, students can be placed out or placed, they can be expelled or placed into an alternative school for up to two years for drugs or weapons offenses. Two years is the full duration you can outplace somebody. So at the end of that two years, you do have to provide an education for that student. So in, regardless of circumstances, that's the farthest extent any school district in the state of Illinois can go. But that's a worst case scenario because that's generally not the best interest of anyone. And it's truly the phone game. If I went here and told that gentleman something, and they whispered it down, by the time it got over there, I'll have three snakes, two purple heads, right. and a partridge and a pear tree. <laughs> it just goes that way. Anyhow, 
I'm very pleased with the fact that our chemical use policy and our, our handbook in general is not just punitive, it's educational. It provides opportunities for students to get help. And it's that way, uh, there, there's, there's two people that are, uh, well, I was proud to work with a gentleman by the name of Chick Williams, who was the Dean of Students here at Geneva High School for many years. He made sure that our code of conduct and our uh, handbook was not just punitive, but was educational and helpful. And he became a drug counselor himself. And I know helped many, many students and parents in this community before he unfortunately passed away at an early age. But I'm also proud of the fact that the three deans, Mike Kelly was the gentleman who just spoke, Reed Allison is standing here to my left, and Susan Schrader over here. These three have made revisions to that code of conduct since Chick was the dean, and we continue to do what has been mentioned here on several occasions. We give kids a second chance. We don't stigmatize those kids who make mistakes, who we don't know what's going on at home. And so when Mike described expelling or sending to safe schools, during my career, we've never expelled anyone. We've given them the second chance to go to safe schools, which is located in St. Charles. It's a county-sponsored program where, along with continuing to get an education, they can also engage in, perhaps, some chemical use uh, rehabilitation or some, some more education, some family work with their family. And if they do what they need to do, then because of state law, we have to welcome them back. So I don't have any idea what exact scenario you're describing, but over the years, we have had scenarios like that. Now, sometimes if that student were an upperclassman and we determined that that two years is what needs to happen, then no, they don't come back, but they get an education. And we believe that they need to get that education so that hopefully they can take advantage of that second chance or maybe that third chance. I, I guess that's something I want to stress. We know that students are making mistakes here in our school and in our community. I took note of something that Tim said earlier. Don't keep it a secret, folks. You can share it with us. We need to know so we can all work together. We're not going to look at your son or daughter any differently. I know it's going to be difficult for you to believe that, but we're here to help them. We want them to be successful. If you read our handbook, if you read the athletic code, extracurricular code of conduct, you see that we give kids second and third chances because we want them to be successful. We don't want to cast them aside. So partnering, not keeping secrets is a real key to us, I think, battling this problem. Um, let's see. Tips for getting, does anybody have any tips for getting your kids to be truthful with you? <laughs> Did the DEA have a lie detector that they could hold on to? That's a tricky one because at the event I was at last night, that there was this, we had a great discussion, even though it was a smaller group, about how parents wanted their kids to be honest with them. But if you set a boundary that's basically a zero tolerance boundary, the parent felt like they were asking for dishonesty. It's a bind, right? That's a difficult situation. But I tell you, the bigger risk is to Im imply or implicitly or explicitly basically say that it's okay or be smart or those types of things, hoping for honesty, than it is to set that boundary, boundary and work around catching them and trying to open up an honest dialogue. Trust me, it's much more dangerous to, to try to be that, again, a lot, a lot of times it comes along with the friend parenting, just be honest, let's keep an open discussion. It could be dangerous, so it's, it, it, there's no easy answer. I wish I could tell you there was. It goes back to this. From 12 years old on, kids are spending eight to 10 hours a day in front of a screen. Eight to 10 hours a day. I got up at 5.30, fished, hopped on my bike, I got home at 6.30 at night for the dinner bell. We were never home. If you're not tracking your kids' phones, especially when they start driving, shame on you. There's apps that will tell you exactly where they are. Hell, I've got one in my wallet because I lose it all the time. It's a tile, and I can put the tile in there, and if I lose my wallet, the app will tell me. Tell you where your damn kids are, too. Because if your kids are going to the west side of Chicago or Aurora lot or whatever, they're in the, but you gotta be open and honest. But this thing is your kid's world. And if they're getting all crazy, take it, take it away from them for an hour. Watch them salivate like Pavlov's dog. <laughs> Seriously. How many, how many Instagram likes did you get today? How many Facebook? Kids worry about the wrong shit. I'm going to be honest with you. I tell it the way it is. What happened to getting out, making your, your kids don't make their bed in the morning? Got an issue. There's a great video from a Navy SEAL commander 
talking about making your damn bed every day. Set a goal. Kids today, one of the things I asked the kids yesterday was how many of them actually wrote down goals? And I'll ask you, how many of you wrote down goals going into 2018? Be honest. About as many as the students. Got it all figured out, huh? Don't want to change anything. Same with the kids, you know. They've got to have pen to paper. And as parents, there's a contract. Here's what I want from you. Here's what I want. My kids even always knew, if you're at a party, and God forbid someone's drinking, call me. Have a safe code. Text me XX. I'll call you immediately. Uh, hey, mom's in the hospital. You need to come home immediately. Boom, it's an instant out. Kids need to have an out. You have to have an out with your kids. And they got to be able to text you, hey, XX, something's going on. I'm at a party where there's drugs. Come get me immediately. But you have to have those conversations. We can talk with you afterwards. So I'll give you a man's cell phone every time. <laughs> I would say be realistic, too. I mean, you're probably here for a reason. Maybe there's something, your spidey senses are going off. Or, you know, if don't ignore the obvious. If the school calls you and says, okay, we found a bag of weed and a pipe in your son's locker, chances are your it's kids your probably it's smoking it. weed. <laughs> You'd be surprised the number of parents that would then fight with the school and the police to say, oh, he was just holding it for his friend. It's not his. He's just being a stand-up guy. Hey, what planet are we all living on here? I mean, you don't, don't ignore those obvious things that are smacking you in the face. You don't have to be a human lie detector. You just have to be Captain Obvious. And look and pick up on what's going on around you. Usually, I, I want to mention something real quick. Usually at events like this, we're preaching to the choir. Usually you guys are parents, and kudos to you, a lot of you, most of you, all of you, are parents that are probably doing a lot of the things we're suggesting. You're implementing rules and boundaries. What I would suggest is join us with the parents that you know, students that, that you know that are struggling with boundaries, struggling with enforcing and try to share the message because there's a lot of parents that aren't here that need to be here and please share that message that we're that we're trying to convey to you i know somebody has the microphone i'm going to come to you in one second i was reminded that we had a question asked on facebook that i want to get to and it's a perfect opportunity for me to introduce the person who has uh, i think a great deal to do with why this room is filled tonight and it's geneva community unit school district 304's communications coordinator laura sprague laura would you stand up for a moment <laughs> you saw that great video that was put together and tweeted out and put on facebook that was laura's handiwork so great job and um, she reminded me that a question was asked prior to this evening that said, why don't you have the drug dogs search the kids and their lockers? The answer to that is, we do, but I have to clarify. We have, as uh, Sergeant Frieders mentioned, we have a great relationship with the police department as well as the King County Sheriff's Department. And over the years, we've had the drug dogs come and they, they will bring multiple dogs and we can do, uh, search the building in a very short period of time. But the question asks, why don't you have them search the kids? We cannot. It's illegal to have the dogs come in contact with students. So what we have to do is we lock down the building, they stay in their classrooms, and then we bring the dogs up and down the halls and they check the lockers. Unfortunately, our kids are savvy enough that the dogs have rarely found anything in our building. And we haven't brought the dogs in recently due to a variety of issues. We're trying to do that again this semester. So if we do, that is something we always notify you of. We're required to do that as well. So we're hoping to make that happen uh, during this semester. Let me flip the script. How many of you have brought a drug dog into your own house? <laughs> I'm serious. They're, believe me, their services. You think there's an issue, bring the dog into your house. He Call me. For 200 bucks. <laughs> We're going to give up this cell phone. Yeah. But you got to understand, a lot of the kids that are even doing drugs actively in school, they might do it before they come in without taking pill. They're really not bringing a lot of drugs to school, but they're hooking up afterwards or wherever. The kids are smart today, and if it's these research chemicals, the dogs won't sense it. Thank you, audience. So I have a couple comments. Um, the first, another thing to look for, for edibles, they take the little candies and then they put them in an existing candy type container. So when you find the container and you open it, you're like, what's that? And it looks like what's supposed to be in there, but it's not really what's supposed to be in there, and you know that. Those are it. Um, 
with, with, I'm obviously speaking from some personal experience here, um, we have a great problem with kids with anxiety and depression. It's huge on the rise. Um, it's not the, the rumored drug dealer that you need to worry about because they, they have plenty of people. It's our kids that are anxious, depressed, lost. Um, Tim, your story really resonated. And they're, they're, that's their way of fitting. And then when they can't find their group and they can't find their friends, the ones that will take them in are the ones who are doing the drugs because, Absolutely. oh yeah, we'll be here. And until they get off those drugs and realize those aren't really their friends, they don't really know what friends are. Um, also, figuring out who the kid is in your friend's group, they're the most polite. Honestly, they're the ones who you think are just the sweetest kid because they come in and they're like, hi, how you doing, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so? Thanks for having me over. And they leave. And that's them. So my question is, <laughs> I do have questions. When you get to that point and you know your child is struggling, because they all do, it's that time of their life, and they're, and they're stubborn, how, how do you get on top of that? How do you, you can't, it's difficult to force them, especially if they're functioning, high GPA, and all, you know, people look at them and think they're totally fine, and they go to school every day. How do you get them the help that they need? I would say, be careful with, you know, I, I talk all the time about want, wanting versus willing. You know, most, most kids aren't gonna reach out and ask for the help, but you, you as a parent have to recognize what's going on and try to make them at least willing. I can't tell you how many kids I've sat in front of the first time I met them and they were just staring daggers into me. But you would be amazed with a little bit of empathy, a little bit of actual listening, understanding how that could turn around in an hour. And so sometimes you have to just, hey, we're gonna go meet with this guy, we're gonna do this assessment, we're gonna have this meeting. And if they're good at what they're doing, there's a good chance by the end of the session they'll say, well, maybe I'll go one more time. Or it wasn't as bad as I thought. Sometimes you gotta, you gotta be able, you gotta nudge. You gotta say, well, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna give this a try. Because if you, if you wait for them to say, okay, let's go, you might be, you might be waiting forever. And, and some of the things I hit on yesterday, you have to understand. Today is much different from than we when we grew up. These stupid things, the bullying. I asked how many kids have been bullied through Snapchat or through Instagram. Three quarters of the hands went up. You know, it's easy for me, hey, did you see that dumb guy with the purple hair? And it goes through the school. Kids today, social media is their world. It's everything. And it's easy to pick on and bully someone. Then that person's getting depressed. They're getting lost. And you're absolutely right. They gravitate towards the outcasts, the stoners, the partiers, the people that will pull them in. Why do you think kids go and join street gangs? Because they have friggin' broken homes, dad's in prison, mom smoking crack, prostituting herself. They're the only ones that care for them. I understand. And it's the same with our kids. And if you're being a friend to your kid, big mistake. You need to be a parent. Your house, your rules. If you gotta take the damn bedroom door off, take the damn bedroom door off. That's your car, you paid for it, you insure it, you pay for this, if you gotta shut it off, shut it off. You gotta take away computer time, take it away. You gotta take away that Xbox, take it away. We get calls all the time, parents that say, hey, um, I think my kid's smoking weed, he might be selling a little, and I, I don't wanna do anything. You know, I don't wanna be the bad guy. Can you come address it? This, this is a partnership. We are in this together. We can't arrest our way out of this. So, yeah, I can send a new uniform officer over there. We'll do what we have to do. We can get you on a path. But if we don't go to that path together, and you don't set parameters, you don't have guidance, you don't give him the same message that I give as the police, we're all wasting our time. So absolutely, we're an, we're an avenue for you as well. You can call us. We can, especially if you're in the, that juvenile justice system, 
it's set up for getting people into those kind of services. Can I push you to counseling? Can I get you to a program to get you to learn and, and make some better decisions in your life? That's how it's set up. It's not the hammer that you think that it is with the police if you're under 18. But whatever we do, you have to be able to do the same thing. And you have to take the door off. You have to take the phone. You have to take the keys. You have to be engaged. Unfortunately, a lot of the kids run the homes today. That's the problem. The kids are running the house. Dad's working, mom's doing this, soccer. Fine, go here, take it, go, bye. It's not what you brought kids into this world to do. So our time frame for tonight. Okay, so we've got two questions up in the audience that we will honor. And then I've got a couple here. At the beginning of the evening, we had set aside 45 minutes for Tim's presentation. And then we set aside 45 minutes for this Q&A, and we feel it's very important that we give you an opportunity to ask questions and seek help from the folks that have volunteered their time tonight to come set up tables in the cafeteria. I know I've got questions here that haven't been asked yet, so I'm kind of letting the folks know that are going to be manning those tables that we're going to be sending people out to you here in a few minutes. One thing we've always done in our uh, presentations, whether it's ninth grade orientation or this, as we dismiss you to go out to the cafeteria, we know we, you might have some questions that you want to continue to talk about. We will stay here. If it's school related, come on down. The three deans and I will make ourselves available. I'm certain these gentlemen will stick around or they can meet you in the cafeteria and we'll stay as, late, as long as we need to stay. Um, so up here in the audience. Uh, I have a two-parter. Um, I have a child who has ADHD. We have Adderall in the house. Um, I became aware that her after school med that she wouldn't normally take on the weekends um, was starting to disappear. I believe she was giving it away to a friend. We lock it up now, but after discussing it with her, she said it's a huge problem at GHS. I just want to make parents aware of it from my standpoint. It's locked up now. I watch her take it. Um, so that's one thing that I had never even thought of. Saw a text message referring to XR, someone asking her for XR, and that turned me on to it. But um, I just never thought my kid would ever do that. And you know, here we are locking it up. So that was one thing. I don't I'll, know if you can. Can I uh, tag team off of that? Because that's a yes. great. I love that. That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, so I, I did some research and pulling out drip numbers, because who doesn't love numbers? <laughs> I mean, that's great. Uh, so looking at the, the, the amount of drugs that we take in here in Geneva, and I'm just running the, just a, a basic search of what does the Geneva Police Department enter into our evidence room, I can tell you about roughly per year, and it fluctuates, I would say last year we had about 10% of the drug arrests that we had were pills. So that could be the ecstasy pills, the Adderall pills, um, it's a bigger issue, like they said about the dark web now, you can get those prescriptions sent right to your house. So roughly 10% of the arrests that we're making on the streets, those people are having pills that are on their person. My second part is I am a freak. I read her phone 24-7. I want to install some of the other things because I know things get deleted. I see all the time on Instagram kids here at the high school who post themselves doing drugs, who post themselves doing illegal activity, you know, bragging about it, they're, they're kids that she follows. What the hell do we do with it as a parent? If I don't know these parents, so I don't know these kids. So you do with the kids, you snitch on them. You turn it in, you exp that's where they're doing where? everything. Where? I don't know, high school. Call the dean's office, call me. Uh, we, we will take that information. Uh, in fact, that's a good segue. There's, there's multiple questions here on cards. What do you do if? And the, the, the ifs are all over the map if you discover them vaping, if you determine that they're under the influence of alcohol and marijuana here at school, if they have pills. The student handbook will tell you exactly what we do, but I have to make sure you understand. We can only do it if we're aware of it, if we can investigate it, and if we can prove it. And remember though, this isn't just the, the school administration's problem. Some parents are bogus, they're on bullshit. I was. My element, I'm the, I was that guy, I didn't care. Um, but it, it's doing, it, it making everyone aware. And I want to let the parents know. I have, if you're into Facebook land, I have a group called A Man of Recovery. It's a closed group. It's only the people in there. That's where I get a lot of parents robbing all these 
asking questions. It's got 5,000 people. You can go there. There's plenty of resources. You can ask it. The kids aren't going to know about it, whatever, and go from there. I just want to assure you, when we know about something and we can determine that it actually is happening, we will not turn our back on it. We will not give someone preferential treatment. We will not say, oh, there's a big game on Friday night, so we're not going to worry about that. But we have to know, and it goes back to that secret thing. Uh, Tim did a, an exercise yesterday. Each class, he brought two kids on stage who were friends. What are you going to do if you see your friend making horrible decisions and using, using drugs? What are you going to do? Tim taught the kids yesterday, tell somebody, snitch on them. The whole auditorium, when Tim said, what do they say about snitches? The whole auditorium said, they get stitches. And Tim? No, 95% of the people that get arrested snitch within the first hour. It's called cover your own ass. <laughs> Back through SM law enforcement. So probably, heard, well, probably 98%. Yeah, but, yeah but, but I get the kids to empower. Hey, you know, I see my buddy Matt. Hey, don't worry about it. I'm fine. If you see it, you got to escalate it. And I'm telling you, I speak all over the country. The amount of staff and resources here is through the roof. When I walked out of the school yesterday, I had over 180 Instagram friend requests from the students. I've had over 30 messages from your kids thanking me. I need help here. I need help here. And that's what I am. I'm a conduit to communicate, and then we'll find the right resource. You can pass that on to us. Call your police wherever you are. You might be in the sheriff's office. You might be us. Um, if you remain anonymous, the information is difficult for us to use. It's, it becomes more challenging in using it in a court case pushing forward. But I would also push it back at yourself. If you come across that information, what are you doing? You have to act on it as well. You have to say, okay, well, you were out. I see last night you were over here and everybody was getting high. Did you confront your son or daughter when they came home? Or what are you doing about it? You have to be, it has to be a united front. You have to do something as well. Uh, Reed Allison just reminded me. As I said earlier, there's not always a punitive consequence when you communicate with us. We've had many examples over the years where rumors are flying around town that on Saturday night there's going to be a huge party at so-and-so's house. Well, we can't prove that, but we can sure pick up the phone, and we've done it many times, to pick up the phone and say, Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so, are you aware that there's a rumor going around town that you're having a big party Friday and Saturday night? <laughs> Oh, that's a Tim Ryan's house. <laughs> We've called. It's quite honestly, it's a courtesy call. We can't issue a consequence because somebody might have a party, but there are many times where the parent says, "Wow, thank you. We were supposed to be out of town Saturday night." So it's great to know. There again, partnership. If you tell us, and and we'll we'll reciprocate. We'll tell you when we know there's something going on. If we work together, we can help our children. Um, it's five to nine. Where's the microphone? Right All right, last audience question, and I'll see if we can get one more from the cards, and then we'll go outside. Okay, and I wanted to add on to what you just said. I'm going to try not to get emotional. Um, the administrators at Geneva High School and the counselors, Geneva PD and Rose Krantz, saved our son's life. couple times we were communicating with the high school all the time he wound up going to Rosecrans after the third time I'm like we're done during family weekend he said you know you're the only parent who had who had the cops called on their own kid and I said you know what I'd do it again I said because I'd rather visit you in jail than at a grace so, okay so my question goes back to vaping. Unfortunately, I have a daughter who's got a lot of friends. You know, she's part of the, part of the, the That crowd, huh? Yes, yeah, part of that crowd. Um, so now that we found it, we, we know where she gets it. What can we do? Can we call Geneva PD and say, we know that this shop is selling to underage kids? Is that what we should do? Yeah. Okay, that's what I needed to know. I'll be outside. I'll be my car. Okay. What is that? What did you say? 
Oh, it's Rose Vape Shop on Randall. Sells to underage kids. Awesome. There you go. Make a prize, you guys. But you know, that's, joking aside, this is what it is. And this isn't a lynch mob of it. I don't need 80 parents showing up there. You son of a gun. <laughs> allegedly. Yeah, allegedly. Thank you. It's being aware of. It's talking about it. It's not spreading rumors. It's facts. It's caring about your kids. It's protecting them. And if you see that, it's like if you saw someone push down an old lady in a mall, would you say, man, knock it off. What are you doing? I heard uh, a gentleman speak. He was the uh, Surgeon General for the country of Israel uh, back during the mid-early uh, 90s, 2000s. And uh, his country, they don't have a philosophy of see something, say something. He said, that's ridiculous. Saying something means nothing. Because I can't tell you, and I totally agree with him, I can't tell you the number of times somebody said something three hours after the fact. It does me no good. If you see something, do something. Don't just say it. Do something. Get up, put your feet on the ground, take some action. Uh, there's a quick question here. Is there a home drug test for heroin? Sure. Yes. Absolutely. Go on Amazon. <coughs> Everybody knows Amazon, right? I know y'all do. You've had those white bands. Yeah, don't man. You can Jump watch on out. Amazon Prime tonight. <laughs> Look at that. I, I don't, write this down. I easy. Don't get a residual. The word easy and then the at symbol. Home. Easy at home. Not the word at. The at symbol. And you're going to see any kind of drug test you could ever imagine. They're cheap. They'll, you can have them. They'll deliver them tomorrow, probably. And they're a cheap. lot of them they are work. 8, 12 panel. Right. And they're 99% accurate. If you go to drug tests and they refuse to take it, it's automatically dirty. Plant that box on your counter. Make sure that the kids see that, that, you, that, you're, that you're in business. And it's usually truth serum. Johnny, we want a drug test. You know, I was at this party the other night and I drank a beer and I think there might have been a Xanax bar. But it was Max. It's always blaming me. Yeah. So. I want to just real quickly thank a number of people and it'll give me an opportunity to introduce a colleague of mine as well. This was a huge team effort tonight. The entire Geneva High School administrative team, Doug Drexler, Scott McPeak, our assistant associate principal. You've met the three deans. Geneva High School social worker, Kelly Husselbaum, are you in here? If you are, stand up please. Our Geneva High School Student Services Coordinator, Shannon Del Rey, and our Counseling and Advising Director, David King, if you're in here. I've already mentioned Laura Sprague. Thank you again, Laura. Uh, I want to thank our panel. Uh, to indicate just how great of a team effort this was, Sarah Konsdorf is our Geneva High School Child Development Teacher, and she and Geneva High School students are currently babysitting a number of young ones who, whose parents wanted to come here, so they volunteered their time tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs> Some other school folks, Lisa Meister, an outstanding health education teacher here, and Tim Baker, retired Geneva Police Officer and now our security supervisor here in the school district. They are our Geneva High School Operation Snowball sponsors. They will be in the cafeteria as well, and they were the ones that gathered the statements you saw on the wall on the way in, those were Geneva High School students talking about their friends and families, and it was on the PowerPoint here. So I want to thank all of those folks, and if I've forgotten anyone, I apologize. But the next person I want to introduce, and he'd just like to share a, a little bit of, uh, I think make an appeal to our middle school parents as well, and that is Mr. Larry Bidlack, the principal at Geneva Middle School North. I do want to say thank you for coming this evening, and I also want to thank the high school administration um, and their staff for putting this together. Um, as you probably are aware, the issue of drug use, alcohol use, doesn't necessarily begin when they walk into the doors of Geneva High School or any high school. And yes, we do see some at the middle school level as well. So I want to dovetail with something that Tom said just a, a little bit ago, that if you are aware of drug or alcohol use among your children or your children's friends, call the school. 
call me, call one of our administrators. I know uh, Ms. Ashley Weltler, our assistant principal, is here tonight as well. So please reach out to us, reach out to the administration at the middle school level, and so we can help you. Thank you very much for coming. So I apologize that we were not able to get to all the questions. I thank you for having so many questions. If it's a school-related question that you were trying to ask and we've not been able to get to it, please email it to us and I or a member of our administrative team will respond to it for you. We will call you, we will email you back, whatever you prefer. I'm sure the same thing holds true. You can email Sergeant Frieders at the police department. You can email Sergeant Faza at the sheriff's department. You can call Rosecrans and get help there. Tim Ryan has all kinds of resources out in the cafeteria. I can't thank you all enough for caring for our children. Thank you all for being here. We will stay here. If you want to talk to us down here, come on down. Otherwise, please feel free to take advantage of the resources.